What are, you sh- what are you shaking Anthony down for, Tony? Yeah, yeah. Unico? Asking, Unico? For, yeah. for the macaroni dinner or the comedy night? That's what I just asked. I came out of Rocky Hill. Yeah. You want to check your email? Thank you. Oh, that was during vacation. Yeah, it's over. Right, I was my email. Good evening. Happy New Year. Welcome to our regularly scheduled first meeting of 17, January 3rd, for the council. Amy, could you lead us in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Dolores? Councilor Bellow? Here. Councilor Hammond? Here. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Latina is not here yet. Councilor Martino? Here. Councilor Rell? Here. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Barry? Here. And Mayor Montanieri? Here. Thank you. That sounds good. We have no public hearings. We'll go right to public comment. Anyone here this evening to speak with public comment? Gus? Good evening. Uh, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, just a little comment uh, regarding the new contract with uh, I guess between the town and uh, and the employees, I was really uh, a little bit disappointed. Uh, basically, a year or two down the road, they're going to tell me since that's contractual, there is no way it's 2.2, 2.3, and I guess 2.4, 25%. That gets pretty good. You know, I just want to make a point that I got an increase too on Social Security. It was 0.3%. percent, point three. Now. Do the town employees are going to give you more 2.2% worth of efficiency? I don't know. I doubt it. I hope so. I also was disappointed that there were not too many questions from the town council right here. You know, they had a little presentation and says that's what we agreed on and it's going to be signed. I also was disappointed with you, Mr. Tony Martino. Uh, you should have abstained for moral reasons, I guess. You know, you know a lot of people in town, and uh, can you really vote against uh, giving them an increase? I was a little bit disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Happy New Year. Anyone else? Public comment? Seeing none, we'll move into council reports. Council reports this evening. Pretty quiet. Quiet. Donna, anything? Nothing. Tony. Uh, we had a public works committee meeting, and uh, we had the representative from VHB do a presentation for us on our road program, and he'll be doing that for the full council tonight. <clears throat> we also had a review by our uh, town engineer on our dam projects and uh, the progress on the Bell Pond Dam that's moving forward for repair. Uh, we reviewed the painting of the Standish House and the... Uh, Solomon Well House for consideration, and we also discussed the replacement of the turf at Catone Field at that time. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> Anything else? Nothing? Okay. Council comments today this evening? Council comments? Tony? Uh, <coughs> I'm sure most of the public has seen the uh, letter in the paper where our funding from the state is being cut for this year's budget as well you know we don't know about next year's yet uh, so we will be reviewing that we've got a full meeting of the full council to review this year's budget and next year's to get a start on on things coming up in a couple of weeks my only suggestion or my only uh, comment is if any of the, anybody in the public has any ideas on where they think you know cuts are justified if they'd give me a call as chairman of budget and finance I'll be glad to bring them forward and look at them for them and get back to them with answers on them. <coughs> Thanks, Tony. Could, Jeff, uh, I'm sorry. could I just ask a favor, Tony, or, or through the town manager, maybe during his report, to really just report on to the public what those cuts were from the state in this current time frame? Sure. Because I think it's pretty impactful to know that ha- that has happened and it, and it is going to impact our day-to-day business. 
Thank you. Jeff? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council, uh, just so you are, just to give you some details on the, there were two cuts. Um, the first was the local capital improvement program, which we get $183,000 a year. And that money goes into our road improvement fund and we use it for road reconstruction. Uh, the LOSIP program in Weathersfield, what we do is we kind of gather up funds over a couple of years and then do a full-blown reconstruction uh, using those funds. Uh, the road we were anticipating using the funds on next was Dix Road. We actually had the first year set aside um, and the second year won't be funded, so we don't have enough money to do the road. Um, so th it takes our total road program down from about 1.5 million down to about 1.3. Um, the next item that was cut was ECS, which is educational cost sharing. The original allocation for the current year was 9.5 million. That was reduced by $152,000. Um, there was a formula used that I couldn't attempt to describe, um, but uh, the big cities were held harmless um, at $250,000. You saw some towns lose 90 plus percent of their ECS funding. We lost about six to seven percent. Thank you, Jeff, for that information. <clears throat> Dolores, anything? Yeah, the uh, Town Clerks Association met to discuss uh, legislation for the upcoming agenda. Um, for 2017, some of the things that we recommended last year passed the House, but the uh, Senate did not take them up. I guess they're having um, split uh, leadership in both houses with a, a Dem and a Republican the same in charge, and um, that's pretty much it. We're starting a budget uh, officially for department head well, some of them have already been doing it uh, on the 11th at 2. That's it. Thank you, Dolores. One correction. Go, go right ahead. Instead of 6 it's 1.6% ECS funding. Great. That's what I thought. Okay. Move on to council action. <clears throat> Appointments to boards and commissions. Councilor Hurley. Um, appointment to the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Commission. Roger Masillo. 200 Meadow View, 1 3 2017 to 6 30 2017. Zoning Board of Appeals Alternate, James Riley, 94 Midwell Road, 1 3 2017 to 6 30 2020. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. The motion is second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. We have no other. Action on resolutions on no unfinished business. We'll move into 3A. We have a presentation by VHB. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. Uh, since the mid-1990s, the town has been um, evaluating its road conditions, uh, typically on an every five-year basis. Uh, gives us an opportunity to reevaluate the roads, look at the conditions of those roads, and helps us prioritize those roads that are most in need of repair, and also identify you know, the cost of those repairs as we develop our paving program going forward. Having this as a tool is helpful to help us really try and get the most uh, bang for our buck when we put dollars into roads to be investing in the roads that are in most need of repair. We typically have done this every five years. Uh, VHB has a local office in town. They're a very reputable firm for pavement analysis and design. They have been doing this uh, approximately every five years in town since the mid-1990s. This past fall, we, our five years were up, so we had them come back. They just finished evaluating the 105 miles of town roads. 
So uh, Gordon Daring from there is here tonight to give a presentation as to uh, what that process was and what the results of those findings were and how that will help us uh, move forward in developing our paving program for the next five year cycle. <coughs> Thanks, Derek. Get the wires in place here. Um, good evening. Thanks for having me uh, to talk with you for a little bit this morning. I'll run through this presentation and then um, entertain any, any questions that uh, anyone may have. Um, just an, an overview of uh, what I'll be going through is just a little bit of a background. Um, some, some of the council members have seen this presentation uh, prior, but uh, I apologize for repeating myself to those folks. Um, but we'll kind of go through some just background concepts of what the, this pavement management thing is all about. Um, also, obviously, talk about the results that we found here in Weathersfield and leave you with a few recommendations going forward. First of all, our, our definition of pavement management is that it's a, a planning exercise um, that's, that's geared toward uh, planning the pavement maintenance and rehabilitation. Um, with the, the goal of, as Derek just said, really kind of getting, helping you to get the biggest bang for the dollars that you do have available to put into your road network, whatever those dollars may be. The process that we go through, um, first of all, we have to start off by making sure that we have an accurate inventory of all of the town roads. Um, Derek mentioned we've uh, had the pleasure of helping Weathersfield out for a number of years, so that inventory has really been built and then maintained um, over, over a number of years. Then on a, a periodic basis, we do uh, go out and do just a visual inspection of the pavement condition. We look at nine different pavement distresses, which are things that you and your residents are all familiar with, things like cracking in the roads, potholes, distortions, etc. Um, but we measure them in a very prescribed way. Um, we measure this, how severe they are. So if we're talking about a pothole, it's basically how deep is the pothole and also the extent to which they exist, you know, the percentage of the area um, on, on each road section. Um, we summarize that distress information in the form of a pavement condition index or a PCI number that's on a zero to 100 scale. Um, a zero is a road that theoretically you couldn't even drive on. A, a 100 is a road that's in pretty much perfect shape. Um, the easiest way to think about the PCI scale is to think about the grading uh, scale that we all were subject to in school. Um, if you're 90 or above, you, you've got a road that's in pretty darn good shape. If you're below a 60, um, you've got a road that needs some level of rehabilitation. When, once we have the condition information summarized in the form of this PCI, um, we kind of put that, in, it's in, we put it into a database, we combine that with information that we kind of work through with your public works and engineering staff in terms of uh, what type of treatment each road might need at those different uh, PCI levels and also what those improvements were likely to cost. With that information all in this kind of specialized computer software that we use, we're able to project the effects of different funding scenarios on your road network. And I'll, I'll show you um, some of those results a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, th the other advantage of having the software is that it can help your engineering staff develop a list of what I like to call a list of candidate projects. Um, it, can, it can help prioritize the, the uh, projects so that, again, the dollars are being put where they'll do the most good. Um, but that computer-generated list of projects has to be validated through local knowledge, some good engineering judgment, um, coordination with other work that may be going on, like utility work, um, and also doing some logical things like grouping projects um, within a neighborhood all to be done in at in one time so you don't have a contractor coming in and out of an area and costing more. I've got a series of five slides that have photos of roadways at different PCI levels. Um, th this first ro road, Sherburn, um, has a PCI of 100. Um, it's, in, it's in pretty much perfect shape other than it looks like there were some uh, scuff marks that somebody put at one part of, one part of the road. Um, this next road, Southwell, is uh, dropped to a PCI of 89. It's still in very good shape. It only has a few cracks. Um, you can see one in the bottom left-hand portion of, of the, um, the photo there. 
Um, this road's actually at the point where you might want to think about, uh, start thinking about getting out there and doing some crack sealing, um, which is a very cost-effective way of maintaining the condition or preserving the uh, pavement condition. The next road, um, uh, Bunce Road, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, has dropped to a PCI level of 75. Um, this is at a point where either it needs a little more extensive uh, crack sealing work, maybe a little bit of patching. Um, in some cases, we might actually think about putting some kind of a thin overlay on the road to kind of preserve it, its condition. Um, so so there's, there's various types of treatment that can be appropriate for roads in this kind of middle ground. Then we get into roads that are really in need of more, more serious work. Um, this road has dropped to a PCI 57. Um, it, it put, that puts it in a category that we refer to as a structural improvement uh, category. Basically, the kind of work that's necessary here is to mill off so, some amount of the existing pavement and then resurface the road. Sometimes in the process of doing that, there's also particularly distressed areas that may need to be cut out and patched. Um, there may need to be some crack sealing that, that's done uh, prior to the new surface being put down. So that, that work gets to be much more expensive. And then finally, um, we've got uh, Wheeler Road uh, here that has dropped to a PCI 46. Um, it's in really tough shape. And in most cases, uh, probably not all, but in most cases, these, these types of roads that have dropped to this condition are in need of uh, more major work where we actually dig down into the base material and either uh, use a process called reclamation where we kind of grind up the pavement together with some of the base material and then recompact it <coughs> prior to putting a new pavement down or um, if or sometimes full reconstruction which is where we dig it out take the old material away and bring in new material which is obviously um, very expensive and isn't a, a good use of existing resources so that's kind of a last resort. In terms of conditions that we found uh, this year, this fall, when we were out in the field looking at the pavements, um, this, this bar chart shows the distribution of these PCI values over a wide range. Um, the short bars on the left, colored red, are the roads in poorest condition. Um, the blue bars on the right are the roads in best condition. So, um, you know, it's a fairly even distribution over that, that range from the high 30s up to uh, 95 to 100. Um, you know, you see that the tallest bar is in that, I, I think that's the high 80s um, range, which um, is, is good news. You know, that there's, there, there, there are more roads in that higher, higher range than in the lower. Um, to summarize that a little bit further, we grouped those PCIs basically into the, the same five categories that I just showed you through those photos. Um, and what you can see here is there's, again, a fairly even distribution of mileage um, in each of those five categories, which, which are good. Is, again, it's not, not, not bad news, particularly in light of the fact that the, that little red bar at the end represents about seven miles um, that's in need of that most expensive type of work. Um, Derek mentioned that we had done this uh, evaluation about five years ago. Um, this bar chart is similar to the first one we looked at, other than it, what it does is it compares in, in blue the most recent results to the uh, results back in 2011 in red. Um, and, and what you can see is that the, the roads in poor condition, again, on the left-hand side of the, the chart, um, some of those miles have dropped, which is good and you see more miles in some of the better categories to the right. So overall, it's, it's telling us that we have a, slight, a slightly improving trend in, in the condition. In fact, the, the average pavement condition index in town went from 20, sorry, 76 in 2011 to a 78 in 2016. So you know, a slight improvement, um, which is good news. Um, this again just summarizes that chart in terms of five bars. The, um, uh, the, the software that we use and that your engineering staff have and they use as well um, is uh, embedded in uh, the town's geographic information system. So we're able to produce pretty much any kind of map that you might uh, want to think of. This particular one shows the current pavement conditions um, colored um, with red, you know, the, the warmer colors being poor conditioned roads and the cooler blue and green colors being better conditioned roads. So to, to take those mileages and convert them to dollars in terms of needs that are out there, 
uh, this table shows that, that breakout. And again, the, the number of miles in the do nothing on through the quote unquote structural improvement categories are very even um, with about seven miles in the, in the poorest condition um, in need of base rehabilitation. How that translates to dollars you see in the far right hand column with the majority of the costs being, uh, uh, being comprised of the roads that are in need of some kind of basically a mill and overlay type work about 10 million of a total of 15 million dollars in total needs. Um, we did also, in the course of doing our analysis, um, look at uh, what it would cost for the town to change from what has been a policy of replacing uh, the, the worst parts of the curbing when a mill and overlay project is done. Um, your engineering staff will go out and kind of mark out the worst parts of the uh, bituminous curb to be replaced as part of those projects. Um, we looked at what would happen if the town were to adopt a policy of replacing all of the curb pretty much any time that one of those projects was done. The impact in the bottom line is that what is that $15 million backlog would become about a $16.4 million backlog. So there, there's a cost there. There's also some benefit um, to, to full replacement. Um, you know, that's, that's a decision that um, will need to be made going forward. These two pie charts um, take the information that was in that last table and just, you know, present them graphically. Um, the, the one thing that, you know, I, I guess I would have you take away from this is that um, uh, may, maybe two things. One is that while the, the number of miles that are in the poorest conditions, either the structural improvement or base, what we call base rehab condition, um, which is something like 31, 32 percent of the mileage comprises the major part of the costs that are involved. You know, that's the expensive work and that, that's toughest to, uh, for, your, for your budget to handle. Um, the, on the flip side, if you look on the right in terms of cost, those two smaller slivers of, of the pie um, are, would be sufficient to do kind of all of the maintenance work needed on almost 50% of your miles. You know, those roads that are in the, the somewhat higher condition ranges that where the, all they need is some crack sealing, maybe some patching and that kind of thing. So it's really smart business to make sure that you do include as part of your annual road program the crack sealing work, uh, patching work where it's needed, and some kind of in various types of preservation work to keep those roads in, in decent shape. This next chart, uh, really kind of shows two things. It, the, the black line um, that starts back in uh, the mid-1990s shows the, uh, how the average PCI in Weathersfield has tracked um, since that time. And, you know, it, it rose up there for a little while, dropped back down uh, a few years ago, but the, the bottom line is it's, it's only fluctuated between the range of a 76 and an 80. So, the reality is that over the course of about 20 years, um, it's actually stayed pretty consistent. And honestly, and, and from my perspective, um, knowing you know kind of the commitment that the town of Weathersfield has made to its road uh, road network over that time, I think it has everything to do with the fact that a you know a, a decent funding level has been provided um, to kind of maintain the roads in you know what is a, a, a little bit of an above average condition. Um, when, when looking at towns kind of all over southern New England. Um, then the three lines that then continue on to the right show the projected effect of different funding levels um, going forward. Um, the red line that gets up to an average PCI of 82 is based on an uh, annual funding level of 1.9 million. Um, the, the line that's in the middle that, you know, kind of keeps things fairly steady in terms of where they've been that's the 1.3 million um, that uh, was, was mentioned uh, earlier. And then finally, we did also look at what would happen if the town were to cut the, the, the road budget down to 700,000 a year. And as you might guess, um, that sees the average conditions dropping off um, you know, over the five year period that we looked at. So just to um, kind of finish up with some recommendations, um, you know, one thing is obviously to continue to fund your road program in such a way that you can meet the town's pavement condition goals. Um, I can't exactly, you know, I, I'm not a resident of Weathersfield, 
I, I can't tell you what your pavement condition goals have been. Um, what I can tell you is that over the last 20 years, the amount of funding that's been provided and put into the road network in Weathersfield has been about what's been needed to kind of keep the conditions, generally speaking, pretty level. Um, so, you know, that, that's a decision that you and the town residents really have to, have to make. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, continuing to include some crack sealing and other maintenance and preservation treatments in the program I think is really important um, to, to be using the dollars that you do put into your roads in the most cost-effective way possible. Um, if you think back to the pie charts um, and where the, the majority of the backlog of work is, it's in the mill and overlay work. So, you know, that is going to continue to be or should continue to be the most major part of your road program, um, as it has been in the past. But since that's where the greatest needs are, that's where the, you know, the greatest uh, chunk of your dollars should be going. Um, prior to doing major projects, um, you know, for instance, the, the base rehabilitation type work, particularly if it's on a more major road, um, we would really recommend that you kind of do some subsurface sampling and testing, um, make sure that you, you know, that you using the materials that are in place in the most cost-effective way possible. Um, I, I mentioned the, the decision to be made in terms of full curb replacement versus partial curb replacement. Um, you know, that, that may come down, I, I don't know, it may come down, it's, it's a matter of weighing the dollars involved um, with the benefits of having a uniform curb um, that, you know, is channeling the water um, where, where it needs to be. Um, and, and then finally, uh, we would encourage the town to continue to kind of monitor pavement condition over time. Um, the, you, you know, your, your pavements do represent the, the most valuable asset um, that the town owns. Uh, if you look at the replacement value of the roads, um, I can, I'll, I'll bet my house that it's more than your buildings or bridges that you own and, and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a really valuable asset. You, you know, you should make sure that you're using good information um, to manage that asset. So with that, I would uh, entertain any questions you may have. I had a question. Could you go back to the slide where you showed the 1.9, 1.3 million, and 700,000? It only drops off to 74. Is that a big drop? When you're only spending 700,000, I would think that it would drop a lot more. Yeah, um, you, you know, so the, the way the, the, when, the, when the software runs these scenarios, um, it, uh, unless you tell it to do differently, the way it does the modeling is it says, look, wh whatever maintenance work is, is out there to be done, make sure you do that first, you know, and then do whatever else you can in the way of major work. So the way it's keeping it at 74, is by making an assumption that you would, you know, continue to do that maintenance work, and what you would see it would be that the those roads that are in need of mill and overlay, you you cut that the number of roads that you're able to do by probably 50 percent. You know, so the the numbers would work out that way. Um, I, you 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 might the, the residents that lived on the roads that didn't get improved <laughs> might might feel differently about. Um, one other thing, you mentioned the channeling of the water from the, are you saying that if we don't put curbs in, that the water's not channeled appropriately? No, it, it, it's just, it, it, it's, it's just that, right, if, and there are a lot of variables in terms of what, you know, like snow plows, unfortunately, right. being one thing that affects curbing quite a bit, but w without the curbing there, there, the opportunity is the water's running down the edge of the road. If it hits a spot where the curbing is gone or it's just really cracked up, you know, there, there's an opportunity there for the water to get in behind and under the pavement and cause further damage along the edge of the road. Um, I, you know, I, I have to believe that when the engineering department has gone out and done the evaluations, in terms of marking out where, where the curbing should or should not be replaced in the course of a project, I have to believe that they're marking out the areas that are in the poorest condition. Yeah, yeah I, was just, I was just gonna add to that, that normally that's what we do. When we go out there ahead of, ahead of the road project, the milling machine goes through, and then we go through and look at the condition of the curb and make a judgment call on what curb can stay and what curb really should be replaced. I think. Historically, uh, just based on my observations coming in, it looks like we may leave some curb that I think 
we should be looking at replacing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to replace all the curb that's out there. Really, the primary function of the curb is to keep the water running down the gutter lines to get to the drainage system and not be undermining the road. So, you know, going forward, that's, that's something we can continue to do. It just might be a matter of maybe increasing the amount of curb that we're doing to some extent and trying to leave a better product at the end. Basically based on like Gordon's saying, when you have severe cracking or severe structural damage to the curb. The, the other aspect of it is aesthetics, which came up pretty big in this last cycle, um, which my understanding is typically hasn't been brought up. We, have, we are trying to address that because throughout town you have varying curb heights. Some curbs are six inches, some curbs in some streets you have two or three inch curbs. Um, and a lot of times historically it's been an issue where we, we go back and we replace uh, uh, what was a three inch curb with a six inch curb and then it, looks, it doesn't look well because you, you have the high curb, drops the low curb back up. So we are, we are working with the contractor now. We did this last season as much as we could to try and have them use a shorter form, like a four inch form where it's more appropriate or a six inch form where it's more appropriate or if there's small sections, maybe doing some handwork to make the curbing look more consistent with the rest of the curb that's out there. So those are some of the things we can, we can try and do to keep costs down and still get what we're looking for out of the, the project and the dollars that we're putting into the roads. Thank you. So um, a couple questions I have, Gordon. If you can go back to the, where it showed the percentages, uh, in, it was one of the earlier graphs that showed the percentage of road condition uh, under each of the categories. Let's go. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit earlier. That one. Um, it, that that probably does it. <clears throat> so, have there been analysis when we have done the the very the minimal surface treatment, the crack seal, um, the sealing of cracks, and and uh, light treatment? Do we know how much life expansion there is on those roads if we get them early that would lead to uh, less? on the the 40 to 60 percent i mean is there any kind of matrix that shows if we put a little bit more money earlier in we would extend life and therefore getting to the worst number would slow down and then we could get caught up is there such a formula well i mean crack sealing when applied to a road at the right point in time which my belief is that it has been used appropriately you know in the past during the weather's field in other words, you know, you're using it on roads that have that are in the PCI range from say maybe 75 at the really low end up to even like the 90. You know, so there's a pretty wide range in which it could be used. Um, you, you will get an additional five years or so. You know, it's obviously it's not an exact science, but mm -hmm. you get roughly an additional five years of life uh, out of that road. And in in many cases, if if you get after it early on, like you're suggesting, um, you can crack seal once, go back and crack seal again, um, you know, before you're going to need to actually start thinking about doing a, a more heavier treatment like a, like a mill and overlay. So, um, you know, you're, you're extending the time period in between the mill and overlays by anywhere from five to ten years by, you know, by kind of keeping after the but so, I, I guess I, I'm not sure if it answers your question. Now, yeah, no, it, it's going in the right direction, but I, I'm thinking we haven't done extensive crack sealing except for maybe the last 10 years. I think it's a more common practice in Weathersfield in the last 10 years, at least that I recall. It's become, and we're also using different product, and I would also conjecture that the road paving that we're doing and the work that's being conducted is getting better results with longer life as well. So I, I'm just wondering if there is some thought about that like if, if we would get in front of crack ceiling on let's say five six seven more miles a year which is the least expensive methodology would that eventually have uh, such a positive impact on l allowing more roads not to get to that 40 percentile or 30 percentile yeah you see what i'm saying i'm just i'm just wondering i mean obviously we we pave a certain amount of roads that have to be done that have never been crack sealed never been adjusted uh, it looks like there's about 12 to 15 miles of road that are, are so bad that we'll, you know, again, we've seen the numbers. It would be 12, 10, 12, 14 million dollars to get those roads caught up. But it, the other, you know, like, for example, there's, there's uh, roughly 25 miles of road that are in the 80 percentile. Whereas if we just really make sure we stay in front of those so they don't keep slipping back, we might garner some ground. I mean, the battle for us has always been 
and you've seen it. We've hovered 78, 76, 78% forever, although I think it was worse a few years ago. And to, to get to the 80 percentile is, is a derivative of money, obviously. We've, we've spent more on the roads in the last six years, seven years. That little bump that I think that you saw back in maybe 2008, 2009 is when we bonded, I think, $2.5 million. So we got a little in front and a one-time big effort. And then we, now we've maintained a bigger number on an annual basis, which is a different strategy that works fine. But I'm just wondering if we did more at the least expensive could we impact that most expensive over some period of time, 10 years, whatever it might be? Derek, do you know how much has been spent on crack ceiling in the last couple of years? Yeah, well, we've, well, we've been spending on crack ceiling out of the $1.5 million that's allocated. We just talked about the, the LOSIP funds. That's 200000 of that. So we've been spending one point three. Of that, 100000 has been on crack ceiling, about 100000 on uh, deep surface repairs and patch repairs and the remainder on milling and overlay. So, you know, we could, uh, we could, you know, look at it a little further to see, you know, does it make sense to spend a little bit more on crack ceiling and a little less on the other improvements to help extend that. Um, I, I don't know where the 100,000 came from, to be honest with you, originally. That's what we've been doing the last few years. Yeah. But that's something we can, you know, reevaluate and see if we can, if there's any fine tuning that's needed to help, you know, like you're suggesting, put those, Put those dollars to well, the I'm, I'm thinking of that aspect. one picture that you showed. I forget which road it was, maybe Bunts, that was, was, was pretty decent, but it's on its way to trouble. Whereas if we have 12 or 13 miles of that, that we really put some focus on and bought six, seven years of life for that large swatch of road that would allow us, obviously, we would spend less on milling and overlay. If we put 300 instead of 100, we'd take 200 out of that. But I'm wondering, would, is that, have we really looked hard at that to say that might mean? that there's a large swatch of road that's not going to get to that, we've got to completely tear it out. I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to, you know, reinvent your job, but it just I'm wondering how much we've looked at that. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't looked at those numbers yet. We're just getting this data. Mm -hmm. um, so being that, you know, we're at the start of a new five-year cycle, this would be a good time to reevaluate where we are with that. I, I think what I would want to get a feel for is what, you know, what, what number of roads – are in that category, and how yeah. and how many of those can we get to in the time frame needed before they start getting into more um, structural rehab that's needed? Um, so that's something certainly we could look at and you know make an evaluation if we feel the hundred thousand dollars we've been spending is adequate, or if we if that needs to be an adjustment to that. Thank you. What are the the curb replacement? Um, has there been an analysis putting aside the aesthetics of it? Um, but has there been an analysis of um, how long you extend the life of the road if if it's a uniform curb uh, any type of analysis from either you or or the town on that yeah I, I mean we we haven't we haven't you know for instance gone out and done a specific study to say you know let, let's go find the areas where we've got poor con condition curb and you know try to correlate that per, per se I, I I'm, I'm guessing that it's probably you know, it's probably a wide range of situations. Um, you know, if, if if there's been some curbing that really has gotten broken up and therefore it's, you know, the edge of the road has been undermined, then, you know, it'd be an impact. Um, yeah, so I, we, we, we haven't really tried to approach that in a scientific way, to, you know. Okay, and, and what I think I heard you saying, Derek, was you wanted to be a little more aggressive and consistent, I guess, on, on identifying which areas need to be yeah, replaced? Yeah, I, I think that's just my opinion coming in, watching the last program. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, this last program, we did more curb than we normally would do, and there were a variety of reasons for that. Uh, some of it was just looking at some curb that was in bad shape and saying we need to do some more. Some of it was drainage-related. We had to raise the gutters of the road in some areas to get the proper drainage to the catch basin structures, which required us to replace more curb. But and I don't have the exact numbers, but generally speaking, we didn't really spend all that much more on curb than we normally have. We did a little bit more, and I think we'll get a better result out of it. So that's my, that's my opinion or my recommendation, rather than just saying, you know, let's go with the full. We're going to do all the curbs all the time, because that definitely is going to cut into the ability for us to spend more money on other roads and other improvements. Um, you know, maybe we look at just trying to, from an aesthetic perspective, make it more eye-pleasing by just using the type, type of curb we put in, the height to the extent that we can. And also, um, 
you know, just looking at those areas that maybe are, are, are in need of replacement. I mean, there are a lot of areas, depends on the road, every road's different, uh, but those roads that, you know, have curb that's in generally good shape, and that could be, uh, you know, quite a bit of the, a lot of these roads, no sense really tearing all that out and putting a new curb just because that's what we do, you know. So I think it, it makes sense to do it on a case-by-case -case basis and, and make some uh, engineering judgments in the field based fair, on what's needed. To make an observation, I mean that you know we estimated that to go to a full curb replacement policy would increase a 15 million dollar backlog by 1.4 million, or you know roughly 10 percent. I, I would almost guess that if you took that 10 percent and put it into the preservation work that mm -hmm. the mayor was just referencing, you might get a bigger a lot more bang. Yeah. yeah. Well, and if you look at the roads that we've done this the last five or six years, they look fine. I mean, I'm sure there's some cosmetic challenge to that there's you know I think we've got some former members of the dais that were helping push the curbs out a little bit to make it worse as I recall but I, I think what we've done in the good work has actually paid off pretty well and I, I think we've seen some good I mean Somerset jumps out at me because I remember we looking at that when we did Somerset we did the road obviously we did some sewer uh, and drainage improvements which included in the project but at first glance you've got the hard dark new curb next to old curb but once it was blended together and it's faded a little bit it looks pretty fine and from a pragmatic usability it's working perfectly fine I mean, you can go on there a very heavy rain event and in, the road is draining perfectly there's no pockets and i i think that you know to gordon's point that 1.4 million clearly would be far better used uh in in, in additional crack seal additional treatment to kind of push that 25 percent uh number down and and our our upper number up a little bit i would think so but i mean i think we've made some really good progress with the, the methodologies and it, it is helpful to have this information and have every road graded I, I see that grid has every road so that's that's good i mean i'm sure we're looking at that so there's like a lot of good said, work like, like you said it's just a, it's a tool that we use um it does help us get get a start at it and then like you said we make some engineering judgments yeah um and just some just local knowledge of where, where we really need it done but it does give us a good tool to, to start yeah. from and it no, it's good. does appear we've been on track in recent years thank you thank you for the report anybody else mike bro gordon uh, derek this may be more of a scientific question than an engineering i'm sorry for that um over the years changes in salt or brine uh, mixtures and maybe I don't know I see Sally back there um, have any of the the composition of what we're putting down on the road to treat ice and snow has that had a deteriorating effect on the, the pavement out there yeah I, I I don't have a scientific answer you know based on a research study somewhere or that kind of thing however um, it, you know what 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 I, I think that salt itself has a limited impact on a bituminous hot mix asphalt pavement. You know, it's not like concrete. Concrete dislikes salt, mm -hmm. you know, big time. I, I don't think that the salt itself has as much of an impact on hot mix asphalt. Um, what does have an impact on hot mix asphalt are freeze and thaw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I get not, not being an expert in um, snow and ice removal, I'm not sure about this, but um, from, from the perspective of, you know, the, the um, pre-treat and the slurry that, you know, tends to be used today, um, keeping the pavements clear of snow and ice for a longer period of time, if, if that's true and you're getting a little bit less freeze-thaw, um, there may actually be a slight benefit, benefit to, the, to, to the newer slurry that's used and so on okay yeah. and i know having conversations about this in the past uh, weathersfield i guess has a low water table um so that you know the the roads freeze well the the ground bel below the roads freeze more than you know some of the surrounding towns mm -hmm. and that you know that freeze thaw that we've seen for the past number of years definitely does have an impact right. so well um not this, not spring of 2016, but spring of 2015, after the pretty hard winter oh, yeah. that we had, I was really busy for about a month with people, including Mike Turner, and um, you know Jim Solmi in Rocky Hill, and down in Cromwell, and kind of along the Connecticut River Valley, where you have that 
groundwater condition and the soil conditions that you have here in Wethersfield, everybody was seeing crazy frost heaps. Mm -hmm. You know, because like you say, what happens is the water gets through capillary action, the water gets pulled up into the, the road base mm -hmm. and creates ice lenses that expands and, and creates the, the you know, uh, heaves. heaves. Yep. And, but then when the spring comes and things thaw and those ice lenses melt and go away, the road will kind of come back yeah. down and yeah, some Pot holes and yeah. fill yeah. with water and yeah. refreeze and you're back at it. Yeah. Okay, so. thank you. J just uh, to that point, um, and even, I mean, Dick's Road was an example we've, when we've been looking at that, um, the notion of using um, under drains to keep the water out, to, to keep it below the road level is something that, you know, we, we were looking into as a, you know, a potential solution to, to stop Now, that. when you say Dick's Road, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, that's on the top of the list to be the most recent resurfaced we were going to reconstruct that with low ship funds and that's part of the 186,000 that was that was the low ship funds that were taken away taken away or not authorized or capped out or whatever it was. and would you say in your opinion you know Derek being the engineer and Gordon looking at the PCI rating Dix is definitely a um, one of those targeted 60 or below yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's in need of, you know, mill and overlay and or something maybe even in some places a little more significant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Have we heard comments or concerns from residents on Dix Road about that? Yes, about getting Condition? it fixed? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Regrettably, there are cuts from the state of low SIP funds that are going may impact the resurfacing of that well we're gonna to have to evaluate the whole program and see if we're gonna to recommend to the council in, in lieu of the low ship funds do we then put aside money that we would spend for rehab right full depth removal as we would with the low ship funds and then not do as much of the other stuff we're gonna to have to take a look at that because there are roads that are gonna to have to be rebuilt and we just can't not do that so we're gonna find a new formula somewhere <laughs> to make that happen Mm -hmm. Or pray, hope, wish, and uh, that low ship gets restored in the spring with this session. So. Thank you. Eric Gordon, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very thank helpful. You. Thanks. Three B. Well, you need a motion on that one. Um, I don't think we have the motion to accept. We're just accepting the report, so I think we're fine. Anthony, can I get a motion to uh, both and authorize the town manager to apply for and accept KSAC grant for prevention programs for the students of Wethersfield for an amount of five thousand three hundred forty two dollars. Thank second. you. Motion a second. Uh, I know Kathy's here, I'm sure on this and uh, yeah. come on up. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Town Council members. Um, we are here to ask for uh, approval to apply for the KSAC Capital Area Substance Abuse Grant. Um, our department has applied and, and gotten awarded this grant for many years now. Um, the grant allows social and youth services along with our um, local prevention council, which, uh, which is our youth advisory board, to um, facilitate um, prevention programs here in Wethersfield for youth. Um, along with this funding, we do get some grant fundings from um, organizations such as the Keene Foundation and we collaborate with other towns to put on programs for funding. Terrific. Um, is, uh, if you get this grant along with the other one, is it fully funded or you still have a gap? Yeah, it's, it's fully, fully funded, funded yeah. if, we, if we approve the 30, uh, 342. Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions? Anthony? What, what type of programs do you put on with the money? With the money so we do after school programming at the middle school 
Um, so we have um, like sport activities. We also have um, such things as cooking, um, proactive activities for the, the youth. Also, we've used some funds for a youth conference that targets um, at-risk behaviors um, in the area. And then also, um, it's partly funding um, our youth needs assessment survey that we conducted. Terrific. No further questions? Great. Thank you for your presentation. Well, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extensions. Thank you, you guys. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. I believe we have a bid. Uh, motion to award uh, uh, bid number 651 to Dime Oil Company, unleaded gasoline for calendar year 2017. Second. Motion to second. Uh, Jeff or Sally, who's covering this? Uh, Sally can cover, but uh, we bid our gasoline through Krog, and we got the results. Good, that's, better, and different. That's pretty much it. Um, <laughs> gasoline prices have gone up since last year. We were very fortunate last year to get an extremely low price. Um, Krog did put out another bid. Um, they had six companies respond, and as you can see, the price per gallon is up about 40 cents over last year. Um, it's still running below, and if you've gone to the gas pump lately, every week it's going up. So we really do want to lock in. The big thing is this is on a calendar year. This is not on our fiscal year, so half of it would hit during this current fiscal year, and then the other half would, would go into the next fiscal year. And just to follow up on that, they did anticipate an increase for second half. Yes. So we're yes. not short this year. No, we had, we had placed that in our budget knowing that our rate was so low um, previously that it was it was bound to go up. So you, so you hit the mark, you think, on the other six months fairly closely? Yeah, we are we are definitely in the in the black on it. Okay, great. Questions about this from council? Fairly straightforward. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, minutes from uh, the meeting of December 19th. I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of December 19th. Second that. Any changes, deletions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Public comment? Gus? Good evening again, Gas Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. You know, it's, it's basically depressing now. It's getting depressing and unbelievable. That stop sign. And people ask me, do you really want the stop sign, you know? My youngest one is 27. Do I really need the stop sign? And the answer is no. But the fact still remains. Chifton. Orchard and Morrison Avenue and Orchard and Hillcrest Avenue, it's a mirror image of an intersection, no matter how you look at it. It's the same, except for a few things. Hillcrest Avenue meets every town regulations. It has drainage, 15 foot wide snow shelf, curbing, you name it, no intersectional side distance problem, nothing. And they have three stop signs. Morrison Avenue and Orchard, it's completely different. It's a mirror image, but the road is much smaller. There is no really curbing right uh, in that intersection, no, not curbing, but uh, a shelf, a snow shelf on the other side, on the south side. There is a little bit of a, an intersectional side distance. And we have two stop signs. Now let me compare also Tifton with Morrison Avenue and Hillcrest Avenue and uh, Orchard. Those are identical, identical intersections, except for a few things. Orchard is only about four or five houses. 
Tifton and Ireland has many more, so theoretically there is more traffic coming out of Tifton than Orchard. And one major problem with Tifton is that we do not have the required intersectional side distance. Now the town manager had made a good presentation two weeks ago why Morrison Avenue does not warrant for the stop sign. And of course, he says, no, I say yes, because of the intersectional side distance. But the question that I have, and I will not go away, is why Hillcrest and Orchard has three stop signs? Because all the requirements that they are required for the stop sign, Hillcrest Avenue doesn't meet it. So I'm going to ask why again, and I will not go away until I get an answer. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Mr. Young? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, good evening. My name is Robert Young. I'm from 20 Copper Mill Road. And um, I'm uh, not surprised by this... Uh, the state cuts aid by $50 million. It just shows how bad our governor is in formulating his budget. He was supposed to find so many findings or uh, uh, exceptions to reduce his, his, his current budget so it wouldn't have harmed the towns whatsoever. Unfortunately, he failed. He failed to find his cuts, do his cuts, do his duty. He didn't do it. And now he's throwing it back on us. Same like Metropolitan District is going to throw back their problem with the city of Hartford. Same idea. Things are just imploding. It's, it's a wonder it's taken this long, but it's because funding or borrowing was pretty easy all along. But, uh, you know, now we're having Malloy is saying stretch our water supply. What kind of clown is that? stretch our water supply after the water company gave, encouraged some water bottling company to come in and use a million, whatever, gallons of water a day from us. And then he says this, your income tax is falling. We're having more people leave the state of Connecticut. It's documented again in the Hartford Current. And we're not doing anything about it, are we? I mean, our, our lakes are getting drier. But the deficit is looming. Yet the only positive thing is the MDC now has, a, has an article out here that says fund rated positively. They got their positive fund rated, rating for their borrowing now because they've got everybody else on the hook. And what really leaves me into this issue of the MDC is how in the world did they, did they know this far in advance that the town, the city of Hartford will not be able to pay their, their sewer bill to the city of, to the uh, MDC? Why didn't they just say, we're, first of all, they should pay their sewer bill. It's their obligation. It's the other fees and the, the other expenditures that they have that they can cut back on, they're not cutting back on. They can reduce their, their purchases of dump trucks and backhoes and uh, payloaders and so forth and so on. They could reduce the pensions on their, on their citizens or their retirees, I should say. They could reduce their payroll by reducing heads. Instead, they're coming to the town saying, using the MDC, which is a pawn, to this whole operation and shows you that regionalism doesn't work. And, in, and now put the towns at risk for X amount of dollars. And, and what's this super lean thing? If, if, if Hartford doesn't pay the following year, uh, the MDC wants to get permission to borrow money and put super liens on the, on the towns that are members. Incl that includes Weathersfield. How do you feel about that? And then. Mayor, you, you say in here it's possible that the increased sewer service costs won't affect our taxpayers because you're going to take it out of the fund balance. 
that does affect us. And then what about the the four percent and the two and the the four percent and the six point two percent increase that they were going to whack the citizens, the residential homes and the and the property owners, for the wa the extra water charge? Well, of course we're going to get hit. I I I don't understand you people, how you can support a failing operation in Harford, our state of Connecticut, as well as the MDC and the, city of Har and the city of Harford. They're going to take us over the barrel. They have made the biggest mistakes in the world. And to your credit, their, 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 their town council is so much lower in caliber than, than this council. And you know I'm up here always b and ming They're worse. So you can take that as a compliment. But that council up there is one of the worst. That council has put so many abatements out there. They have encouraged um, all kinds of sales of their own property to, to, to uh, pony up money. And they've done a poor job at that. They've gone into construction business operations like Dunkin' Donuts uh, Stadium, Dillon Stadium. They took people's property up there at Dunkin' Donuts, and now they're going to get hit with another $3 million charge from, uh, to pay the, the landowners who they took the property from. And we, oh, they're not going to pay their sewer charge, pushing that fee or that amount of money back onto us, which really means we're subsidizing them for all their mistakes and all their poor investments and all their poor actions that they have done, and we're, and we're, and we're going to take the licking for it. And it won't be one year. It will be ongoing. So, Mayor, I would, I would encourage you, and I, and I will be here next, Sunday, next uh, Monday night, is it? To meet Mr. Bronin, uh, and, and, and I'll give him my words as well. But, uh, you know, we, Bristol Myers has just left the state of Connecticut. We know that uh, in the past, the uh, GE corporate headquarters is gone. They're gone. Um, they, wanted, they, they had a meeting by the uh, redevelopment agency up in Hartford to uh, talk about renovating the Excel Center. And about what it says is that about 20 people showed up, all, all, all uh, business owners near the Civic Center, and they all voted to spend that $250 million. And of course, the state now will have to find the money because they can't borrow it, or borrowing is getting more difficult for them. So, Mayor, you know, and, and there's, it's just, this is just getting bad, from bad to worse. And, uh, and then, of course, there's an article, nearly a million people can't pay their utility bills. So what? Why should anybody pay their utility bills? City of Hartford's not going to pay their utility bills on their sewer system or on their sewer usage, are they? They're just going to push it out to somebody else. What about these million people? In the state of Connecticut, they can't pay their utility bills. Who are they going to push those costs on to? They're going to turn to the state, the bankrupt state, and say, hey, um, I can't pay my bill. You've got to take care of it. I've got five kids in my house. What's the state going to do? When I run through the expenses for the state of Connecticut, I see so many CLMP and CNGs and the, uh, co uh, the vendors, vendor names. With, with, with dollar amounts. And some of them are not huge, like you would think a big office would cost. And, and I, there's a day, someday, I'm going to go look and see where those places are, because I, I'm, really, I'm really convinced the state of Connecticut pays these people's utility bills. And the rest of us are on the hook for it. Then, of course, we have the, the, the great brainstorm from Mr. Larson, who talks about putting a tunnel under the city of Hartford. I mean, how many millions of dollars is that going to cost? And, and how ridiculous that is. Yet down in Old Lyme, Richard Blumenthal says putting a railroad tunnel under Old Lyme is a tragic mistake. I mean, here's the article. But uh, we have people that don't know what they're doing, <coughs> who are making big decisions. And we have some right nearby here, too. And, you know, it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy, and now here we are. We heard and had a nice presentation tonight regarding the roads. And 
As far as the roads go, I, I agree with a few statements that were made that the pavement is the most valued that, that the town owns. You know, when you think of all that, that pavement that's out there. Um, I also believe that if we're gonna repave a road, we should do a good job on that road. You mentioned, Mayor, about Somerset. I never drive on Somerset, so I don't have any idea what it's like, but I do drive on Griswold Road. I do drive on Highland Street, and I think that several people sitting up here do that too, and that's like uh, bum, 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 all over the place. Uh, whatever that ceiling stuff they put down on, it, it didn't go away, it didn't seal down in. It just stayed and, and created bumps across the entire road. That wasn't a good, smart deal to make. But that road now will probably have to be torn up, Griswold Road, the beginning of Highland Street down, but down by my section. And of course, up your way too, from Thornbush. That's a quite a horrible drive too. Uh, I don't even like going on there with my car. I try, try to find other roads to take. So, Mayor, you know, you've got a lot of problems here, and I think a lot of them are start right here. You've done poor work on some of those roads, and now that's coming to the surface. We have, a, we have poor governing up at the state of Connecticut, <coughs> whether it's in Hartford, the city of Hartford, or the state of Connecticut. And they keep pushing their problems back onto the, onto the local towns, and we're one of the towns that they're going to push. <coughs> and I would urge you to push them back and say, no, we're not going to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the extra time. Oh, wow, we missed you for the holiday. Jeff? Uh, before you go, if you guys want town calendars, they're up here. And anybody at home, town calendars? Town calendars are available at the town hall, at the library, police station, community center. So. We're good. Um, just a word before we adjourn about the meeting for the 14th. Um, I know you guys got an email. I think everybody can make it. Um, Mike is the only one that's a little up near on something you've got going. But uh, just a little homework, if you will, uh, before we meet. M my hope, Jeff is, is, is certainly going to have some information available for the full council about various impacts that uh, will weigh in our budget process. But I, I wanted to have a little bit more of a, uh, a qualitative discussion uh, on the 14th about priorities and where given what is obviously going to be a challenge for us uh, in terms of the budget cycle with not only impacts that are uh, coming with respect to the, the state, which assuredly is going to happen, uh, but also priorities and where we might look. So if you guys could spend a little time on that before the 14th so we make maximum use of uh, a couple of hours, and that will be more of a guidance for us. We obviously are going to spend time during the budget season looking at departments and all the normal processes of line item analysis, but this is a little bit of a broader look that I want to make sure uh, this council gets a chance to uh, share some thoughts, ideas, concerns, obviously, and where in light of what I think will probably be a fairly significant budget impact uh, at both the state and local level. Uh, I, I, I think most of us would agree the answer to what's coming is not increasing taxes on the <coughs> residents, but finding ways to cost cut and, and prioritize, which of course is gonna be a difficult process, but I, I just wanna have us weigh in on that for a couple of hours on the 14th. So please, if you could spend a little time on that. Certainly feel free to get anything in written form if it's helpful before that to Jeff and I'm sure he'll circulate it to council just so we can make good use of our time. Um, yes, well, Mike, Ralph. On that note, is there, looking at the Board of Ed budget right now, are they in a deficit right they now? They are. They're in a deficit of 270000 right now, and the additional 150 roughly, that came out from this year's budget is hitting them as well. I did meet with Mr. Emmett, and we are planning to um, have a sit-down discussion with him after he looks at it a little bit more in depth in light of the ECS cut. I'm sure uh, Steve and I, uh, and we're going to start probably at the administrative level first and then probably go to the budget committee, but we are going to have some discussion about how they're going to address that. It's a fairly significant. Mr. Emmett in indicated to me that part of it is a little bit of a timing issue with special ed reimbursements and uh, bus and transportation that haven't caught up. I don't know how much of that 270 is that, but uh, he's not expressing fear that this number is going to grow and duplicate itself over the course of the full academic year. But 
Uh, but he did share that there is a deficit at this point. They, they imposed a freeze today on spending on supplies, materials, conferences, travel. I, they're, they're taking steps, uh, but we'll have a fuller discussion with them. Mike? Is there going to be information sent out, financial information, before the meeting so yes. we can take a look at it? We're okay. going to do that. We're going to do what we're preparing is kind of a one-page sheet on where we see increases in the next year. You know, of course, we have the debt service for the high school. And then, you know, we've got an MDC regular percent increase, um, OPEB, health insurance, workers' comp, lap and liability, unleaded fuel. So we're kind of breaking out those, those drivers to take a look at and see what the impact is just from a straight up year over year. And then we're also gonna show the different state aid pieces we get and then we'll look to have a conversation. Well, thank you for any work done in the next week or two and participation of that. That will be helpful for us as we, uh, we go into it a little bit. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. In favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <coughs>